Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst Webinar Series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. Catalyst Webinar Series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. Very excited to have Casey O'Callaghan on the webcast this morning. He's the president of Casey O'Callaghan Golf Course Design, Inc. We also have Robin Shelton, SCPGA president and general manager at Newport Beach Country Club in Newport Beach. Uh, Robin just went under uh, a uh, uh, extensive golf course renovation that, that Casey O'Callaghan uh, redesigned and uh, they've been on property there for, I think we talked about the other day, it was just under a year, um, but it was a, uh, a very extensive renovation and facility upgrade. And that's gonna be the crux of Casey's presentation this morning talking about the renovation that recently took place at Newport Beach and some other uh, works that Casey's uh, had his hands in over the over the last several years. Good morning, Casey. How are you this morning? Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We'll take it away. As we talked about uh, in our uh, in our meeting on Friday, uh, the uh, this is Casey's first Catalyst webinar series. This is a interactive Zoom presentation. So all the PGA members that are on the webcast this morning, feel free to uh, come off of mute, raise your hand, chime in, uh, ask a question, interject a comment. We try to make the, the Catalyst webinar series on an ongoing basis as interactive as possible. And uh, don't be shy is what we're saying. So go ahead, Casey, take it away. I'll interject with questions along the way and as will the audience, but uh, we're excited to have you on the webcast this morning. and. Uh, 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 curious to learn about what has taken place at Newport Beach over the last year. Wonderful. And, and John, if you don't mind, um, once we get closer to the end, uh, if you just give me a heads up, I, I've done a lot of before and after. I, I may have too much information in here. So if there's a point where we get close to the end, let me know and I can kind of skip through a little bit more quickly, but okay, I'll take it absolutely. away from here. Absolutely. Dynamite. So the, uh, the presentation is we're going to uh, review just uh, generally the scope and the, the work schedule that we had outlined, what the philosophy and the goals for uh, the project were, um, take you a little bit through the design and planning process that we went through, preliminary design, construction documents, um, contractor selection, um, look at construction, and, and we're going to try to do it in order of how we did the construction and, and the before, during, and after shots. Um, and then um, what our takeaways were, what the lessons learned that we came out of uh, after going through this construction. And then I've got a few kind of example projects of what we've done and I've got questions at the end, but as you said, we can um, ask along the way. Um, the basic scope of work, we ended up doing a two phase project, but we did a complete uh, renovation of the practice range. We did the landing area, uh, the T the area, uh, the target greens, the bunkers, and an irrigation system. And then in phase two, we did 16 and a half holes of bunkers, um, 18 holes of tea complexes, uh, four green expansions, three uh, full green renovations, perimeter landscape, uh, tree removal, and cart path modifications. The reason why we did 16 and a half holes of bunkers is that previously about Two years ago, we had done an example hole at hole number seven to give the members and the ownership an idea of what we were looking to do. Uh, and part of that was on hole number six as well. And so that's why we didn't do those holes during this part of construction. Um, the schedule, and this is the ultimate schedule that ended up. And as I talk, I'll, I'll explain how we kind of arrived at this. But in, uh, in early 2021, we went through preliminary planning and budget to present to the ownership as to what we were looking to do. Uh, in May, we got project approval, um, and then we went through an accelerated schedule from, from May to August. We prepared a construction document uh, uh, package and a contractor selection process. Um, and then uh, in October, we spent one month fully renovating the practice range. We shut back down, we demobilized, and then we started back up in 2022. Uh, in April, and uh, in, in basically three months, we completed uh, the phase two uh, scope of work. <clears throat> we we talked about different ideas as to what we wanted to achieve with the project. And, and I'm not going to read this verbatim, but really trying to make the golf course strategically interesting and playable for golfers of all abilities, whether you are a 25 handicap or a single digit handicap golfer. 
Um, the greens that we're impacting, some of the greens, there there have been a lot of renovation over the years throughout Newport with different architects in there, and they and kind of their they had left their stamp. And and so what we wanted to try to do is get back to long, broad movements on greens that was part of the original golf course. Um, we want to locate the bunkers in the right location, make them kind of interesting and playable. Um, but also we were dealing with accessibility issues for a lot of members getting in and out of the bunkers as well as the maintenance crew. There was only one way in and one way out of the bunkers. Um, we wanted to enlarge the tees and, and create different options for various yardages. Um, and then cart paths are, this is uh, not a wall, wall to wall cart path golf course. And so there's a lot of abbreviated cart paths where they weren't long enough and it was, it was restricting where the maintenance crew could allow members on and off the cart paths. But then a lot of cart paths were located in really unsightly areas that just kind of stood out too much. Uh, and then lastly, um, adding landscape architecture to a lot of the perimeter areas to kind of screen some of the areas outside the golf course. Um, the, the ownership had their own kind of set of ideas. They, they really didn't want to radically change the golf course, um, obviously spend money wisely. Um, they knew and they know uh, that the irrigation system needs to be replaced. Um, they don't want to see cart paths definitely keep the members happy. And then um, a big one, and we'll kind of circle back on this, but keeping the golf course open during construction. When you say, um, Casey, when you say keep the members happy, uh, does that mean, are you talking about accessibility during construction or not making the course too difficult or both? Probably both, John. Um, you know, there's, there's a, you know, uh, the, they've got a very active membership and they love their golf course. And so uh, keeping it open was one thing, but also just not radically changing the golf course because they, they really like their golf course. And that goes into, to, you know, the membership, they, they love their golf course and they played a lot. And honestly, there was a lot of people, uh, a lot of members who really didn't feel that the golf course needed any change at all. <clears throat> we had originally outlined a schedule that kind of, uh, we were able to present to the ownership is to say, okay, this is a schedule that we think we should move to um, to move through the project. And at that time, we were going to do all the work in one phase uh, of construction. And so, um, during the planning process, the ownership really said, hey, we you know we kind of have a downtime in the fall. We know that uh, contractors are available. We'd like to break this up into two so that we can minimize impact uh, in the spring of 2022 when we do the work. We started with the preliminary design process, and um, really it's, it's more of a conceptual plan that kind of gave a high overview of wh what we were looking to achieve. You can see here we're looking at the practice range. We're talking about different yardages. Can you see my highlighter on the screen? Okay. Um, and talking about bunker locations, car paths extensions, um, and that really kind of helped to, to educate the ownership as to what we were looking to do. Um, and then during that process, and it was kind of an evolutionary process uh, where we we made some changes, but we looked at, you know, adding bunkers, removing bunkers, but really working closely with ownership on, on the changes that we were looking to do with the golf course. And then setting a budget, and this is the original budget that we came up with the ownership, and it was, as you can see, it's just under $10 million. And, um, and really the ownership came back to us and said, we don't think that a $10 million budget is going to work for us. We don't think we can, for lack of a better term, Robin, you might chime in, but get a return on investment on a $10 million renovation. So they challenged us to, to bring the, uh, the cost closer to $5 million. And, and really the one thing, um, unfortunately, that, that got delayed is the irrigation uh, renovations. And so we did not do a full irrigation renovation. We just renovated the parts of the golf course that were impacted. And the owners are still looking to, to do that probably in about five years to tackle the irrigation system. But we brought that down. Uh, we brought the cost of the perimeter landscape down and we re really focused on trying to reach a $5 million budget. Okay, so I'll, I'll chime in there real quick and regarding the, the budget process. Um, those numbers kept creeping up and it was a discussion of, it just seemed a little more than our original intent. So we said, hey, let's do everything but the irrigation system uh, because, hey, it still works. Uh, and it's like the engine on a car, it's still running. Nobody looks at it. As long as the conditions are good, people are happy. So we said, hey, let's do everything that everybody can taste, touch, and, and feel. Uh, so that's why we did everything but the irrigation system. Um, 
And then moving on, we moved into the construction document phase of work of, of really identifying uh, plans that contractors could can build the golf course. Um, one of the key steps, um, and then we'll circle back on this in the end, is really creating detailed quantities of what the improvements were going to be. The square footage of bunkers, uh, cart paths, square footage of greens, the amount of sod we were using, the impact areas. And so we created a whole by whole analysis that that really went into um, preparing a, a bid sheet for the contractors to uh, to bid the project. We identified several golf course contractors to bid uh, bid the project. Um, simultaneously, what we also did is identify um, some talented shapers that we want we knew we wanted to work with. And, and the idea being that we brought the shapers on uh, first and that all the contractors knew that they were going to bring those shapers kind of into their fold and work together on the golf course construction. Uh, this is an example of the uh, the bid sheet that we sent out to the contractors. And, and really the idea is that you're having all the contractors bid exact quantities so that we can get an apples to apples understanding of what their costs are gonna be. Um, you know, we've got uh, specifications and details that we provide them with. And um, here's examples, this isn't from Newport, but uh, kind of the process of going for a request for proposal, instructions to bidders, um, request for clarifications during the bidding process that lasts about a month. They've got questions on on different ideas that are in the plans to make sure that everybody understands what we're doing. Um, and then finally, getting a uh, the final bids from the contractors and really doing kind of a side by side analysis and really understanding if there's any major discrepancies in the bid process and really kind of being able to kind of understand and see if there's a red flag and really trying to understand what is the the true bid from. Uh, for the contractor and ultimately determining who's going to be the best contractor for the project. Um, a big part of what we did leading into construction is, is coordinating with the contractor and really trying to understand how we can um, efficiently move through the project and minimize kind of damage to the golf course. There's a lot of haul roads, there's a lot of import importing of materials, there's a lot of construction going on and really trying to keep that to a minimum. Um, and then now jumping into the construction, as I said, it was a two-phase project. And the first phase was uh, back in October of 2021, where we did the, the practice range. And here's their existing practice range, um, Hyper Bermuda on, on the tees. They've got uh, probably about seven or eight green complexes out there that were pretty small and, and, and quite a few small bunkers that were, were out there. Um, also kind of a, a, a hitting bunker or a fairway bunker off to the side. What we look to do is create longer, bigger, broader movements throughout the, the practice range and really kind of going back to yardages that we felt we could have members uh, play from 75 yards to 250 yards. Um, larger bunkers that were going to be consistent with the rest of the golf course. Um, and then during this process, and there, this is kind of an iterative process, but we've got seven target greens out here. And originally we thought we were going to sod all the tea complexes with some form of hybrid Bermuda. And so Scott Dye, the superintendent, suggested that we try different Bermuda varieties on these tea, on these greens, because these target greens are built to the same specification as a tea. It's a four-inch sand cap. And so we we try different um, hybrid Bermudas, but simultaneously coming to the conclusion that we wanted to use Kakuya on the uh, on the actual practice range tea. The thought being is that most golfers who are hitting their approach shots on the golf course are hitting off Kakuya. Why shouldn't they be hitting uh, off Kakuya on the practice range tee? Um, here's another shot of the construction. Um, again, just kind of trying to create long, broad movements, good visuals to all the target greens. And then the, uh, the completed range that was finished uh, uh, at the end of October Again, we've got seven target greens out there. We've got uh, a good good bunkers that visually set up well for, for the players. Um, and again, just long, broad movements. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we demobilized um, and the uh, Newport held the, uh, the, the Hogue uh, uh, Senior PGA event in, uh, in March. And then starting April 1st, we, we jumped into construction. And so the, 
kind of the first area of the golf course was around 15, 18, and 17. And this is a shot of uh, 15 and 18 tees. This is the 15th tee. This is the 18th tee. Uh, 15 comes up this way. You can see there's a lot of cart path that's pretty visible. A lot of cart path in the middle that uh, that we were unhappy with. Uh, 18 as well plays up this way. <clears throat> this is the uh, first landing area of hole number uh, 15. You've got a bunker on the right. That bunker was really in play for the higher handicap golfer. Most of the, your better golfers were hitting up into this zone. Um, kind of a pinched area up at the second landing area with the with the cart path and the trees. You'll see a little bit of it here. Um, and, and really a green, this is one of a few greens that was built uh, by Ted Robinson back in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and Ted did a lot of great work, but he, he he's a lot of places that he touched, he, he used a style that was very consistent with Ted's style and maybe not necessarily consistent with uh, the style of the golf course. And so there was pot bunkers and kind of these longer bunkers that really did tie in with some of the other features on the golf course. Um, this is again looking at the 1518 T complex. And now, as you can see, um, we're, we've created one kind of large back T that was kind of a, a, a meeting point, and then a series of T's that work up uh, to the right for hole number 15, a series of T's that work up for uh, 18. And then we've taken this car path that was out of the middle and moved it over to the side here and out of view of the golf cart. Um, and then uh, essentially, what we also did is shorten the cart path on this side. Uh, because previously it was on this hillside that really was jumped out and uh, was highly visible. So that, that's a shared tee box there for 15 and 18? That is a shared. So this back tee right here, John, is a shared tee box. And so, um, yeah, it, it's actually kind of a neat experience because it's it's one of those crossover points where you're kind of talking with other golfers on the golf course. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, the other thing that, we'll, and I'll jump into this a little bit, but this is the area where the previous bunker used to be located um, and then working Robin really you know Robin doesn't get enough credit for um, really knowing kind of uh, just the membership and in and um, how they play and what they're looking for and we we made a decision to relocate or take out this bunker and then put challenging bunkers on the left hand side you'll see it on the on the next well, shot this is where that bunker up, on the right was just a second can you back yeah. up just a second to the previous slide where is that? It's always interesting when you move a bunker like that and affect playability. How far is the bunkers on the left now that you put in on, think, on, the, on 15? On the 15, I think they're from, from the back tee, they, they range from about 265 to about 310. Okay, so the bunkers that, that you took out were in that 220, 230 range? Exactly. Okay, so was it the philosophy there to not penalize the higher handicapper and make it more challenging for the better player? Yes, and yeah, absolutely. And we just felt like, in in a sense, the it's a short, reachable par five, and it really didn't provide much challenge for the lower handicap golfer, um, but it provided a lot of penalty for the higher handicap golfer. So sure. no, it looks like it. Okay, thank you. Sure. And so, again, this is where this bunker was removed on the right, and then we've got the two bunkers going in on the left. And, and really our goal with these the, the new bunkers and all the features is just to make sure that they look like they were always there. Um, I'll, I'll jump to the green construction, but, but previously this area was pretty tight. The way the cart bath kind of came inside the, uh, the tree complex, it just felt really pinched. Um, and we really kind of strove to to open that area up. We rebuilt this, this right, the second landing area bunker on the right, uh, did a full green renovation, took out the, uh, the step that was there, relocated the cart path. Um, and then um, I, I think that we're seeing, no, we're seeing the sand here, but we, we used a capillary concrete bunker liner for the bunkers. And then you can see some of the final shaping. We've done the, the, the green float here, the sands in the bunkers, and we're probably pretty close, probably within about a week of sodding those improvements. Um, I apologize. I don't have a photograph after photograph of the T complex. It's uh, I, I just don't have it. Uh, my apologies. But here's the a look of the bunkers in the second landing area right here. Um, they're they're low profile. Um, you can hit a, a fairly long club to get out of them unless you're at the far end. And this bunker is probably the second bunker is a little bit more challenging um, than than the first bunker. 
And then, uh, and then the green complex, the second bunker, uh, the car path on the right, and then the new green complex. Again, a, a much more subtle green, a lot more subtlety to this than the than the previous one. I'm going back to hole number 18 now. And again, uh, this was, uh, you'd seen an aerial view of this. This is 15 again, here's 18. With the shared T complex, we're moving now the T back into this area. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, you've got these two large stone pines that, that if you're at ground level, it really blocks probably 80% of the fairway and what you can see. You can only see this one um, a fairway bunker here. Again, you've got a pretty significant cart path right there. And then they've got this beautiful clubhouse that you really can't see until you get to the first landing area. <clears throat> Here's another shot of it, uh, the two large stone pines and the, um, and, and the bunker. Uh, another shot of it. And then the green complex. And then again, this is another uh, Ted Robinson green. He's got two pot bunkers in the back and kind of these smaller bunkers in the uh, uh, in the second landing area. And again, this is a, a fairly short par five, especially for a finishing hole. We were able to add about 25 to 30 yards of length um, on the construction. This is the same shot that you saw before, but here's uh, 18 again. You've got the shared tee. Uh, now the car pass out. And then if you see, this is where the two large stone pines used to be located. And um, it, was a, it was a big decision to remove them. I'm, as you know, members love trees, um, but uh, I, I don't think anybody misses them now because now you've got this just beautiful, clear, unabated view from, from the tea complex all the way through the fairway, all the way up to, um, uh, to the clubhouse. Was the, were the trees in that last picture, were the trees affecting uh, turf growth? in that little for sure it was it, it was it, it there's a lot of shade under there a lot of roots um it was uh it, it was pretty significant john um here's a shot of the second lane area we've got three bunkers on the right um we've got two bunkers on the left you can see everything from from the t complex um and then a little bit of the second landing area the green um oddly enough this is the 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 part of the golf course that we started first. In fact, this bunker on the, the on the left side of the second landing area of number 18 was the first bunker that we shaped, and then these bunkers. Um, and then Robin, you and I can maybe talk about this, but kind of the best laid plans of, of, of bringing together and hiring a shaper and having them work with the contractor, um, we realized on this first hole that they uh, were having trouble getting it along. And, um, and it, it, uh, it, this transpired over about three weeks and uh, it became so difficult that we ended up having to separate them and, and hire the, the shapers directly uh, under Newport Beach Country Club. And uh, it was, that I, I would say that would be one of the more challenging parts of the golf course is that relationship between the shapers that we hired and the, and the, uh, and the golf course contractor. Um, so the the uh, the shaper was obviously wasn't the golf course contractors. No, they're 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 kind of specialty. A lot of golf course contractors have shapers within house, and and many of them are are fairly good. Um, but really, the best shapers out there are the ones who are independent contractors that will get hired on these projects to do some of the work. <clears throat> Um, and then this is the this is the final product. So again, we're 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 about where the the white tee is on this pro, uh, on the golf hole. But this is the area where uh, the stone pines and it really blocked this area. And so now we've got this kind of unabated, beautiful view down the fairway. You can see where the hazards are. You can see all the way up to the clubhouse. Those were previously blocked by that same that grove of trees. That's correct. Uh, this is another shot of the the bunkers in the second uh, in the first landing area, <clears throat> and then uh, and then the uh, the green complex and and the bunkers here. Uh, another hole that we impacted is hole number ten. Uh, this is uh, parallel to eighteen. Eighteen is playing down this way. Eighteen plays uh, ten plays the opposite direction. It's about a four hundred. Or uh, it's about a 420, 430 yard par four. Um, what's interesting is you see the sixth hole here on the right hand side. There's a really uh, a, a prevailing breeze that goes from left to right. 
Um, and a lot of errant shots end up in this area. And unfortunately, you can see all the, in fact, you can see all the cartware here. Um, and some of those end up on the green complex, I mean, uh, on the sixth green. Um, and again, here's the uh, the tenth green. You've got two bunkers on the left, one on the right. Um, really, I don't know if it was due to green green shrinkage. My guess is that it is, but none of these green uh, bunkers were really kind of married to the green. You know, many of these bunkers were 12, 15, 20 feet away from uh, the green complex, and really, um, you know, those bunkers really weren't in play or as much in play for the better golfer who's missing the green by two or three yards but heavily in play for the higher handicapper who's missing it by 10 and 15 yards. So during construction, what we, we strove to do is really uh, do two things, um, create more of a dog leg out of this golf hole. We had room between 10 and 18 to kind of um, expand or, or grow the fairway to the left. We removed the, the, the fairway bunker on the left that was previously there. And then we created a series of bunkers on the right that um, that really just kind of are a no-go zone, saying these aren't carry bunkers, these are just bunkers that you want to avoid. So we created a series of three bunkers on the left-hand side, tied it in with the shaping and the and the movements coming off of number six green, uh, and really kind of encouraged golfers to play to the left. At the uh, at the green. Um, we rebuilt these bunkers, as you as you recall. There was two bunkers here, and there was one bunker here, and then this is one of uh, of the four greens where we did a green expansion on the back. This is one of the smaller greens, um, and I would say one of the more challenging parts of the project. Uh, these green expansions were um, were difficult. Really trying to tie into what the existing grades are and dealing with settling and. And uh, I didn't necessarily put this on lessons learned, but I think in hindsight, we would have stripped the sod off of the entire green as part of the green expansion, um, done these changes, and then resodded the entire green as opposed to just sodding these improvements here. And then uh, again, kind of the, the final shot, this is, these are the bunkers on the right, uh, another part of them, but again, you can see where we really expanded the fairway and really kind of opened this area up uh, and created kind of a safe zone. It's a longer shot. You've got these small uh, twisted junipers here that almost act as a little bit of a uh, strategic element for the longer golfers. Most of your higher handicappers are going to be back here, but your longer golfers are in here and they can kind of get in a, pot, in a spot where if they go too far left, they've got these trees to contend with. <clears throat> uh, hole number 17, which is, is arguably a, a signature hole on the golf course, um, uh, you know, obviously the second to last finishing hole. Again, um, another Ted Robinson green. Um, there was a kind of a two tier, a, quite a big slope that was in here, a large mound that was here um, that repelled shots to the left. And previously, um, over the last probably eight to 10 to 12 years, we removed a series of palm trees that Ted liked to incorporate on some of these greens, and we removed those. Um, but really, we wanted to create a green that was. Uh, as you see, just pl more playable for uh, for your average golfer, but really kind of create some challenge and interest and some interesting pin pin uh, pin locations. Uh, I apologize. This is a little hard to see. It's a little it's a little uh, uh, kind of washed out. But here's the the core of the new green right here. We were able to kind of take the green. The front part of the green stayed in the same location, but we were able to kind of hinge the back part of the green closer to the water and really create kind of a, a challenging back right pin location. Um, you can also see in here, here's the outline of, of, of the new uh, bunker. You can see the proposed drain lines that we're going to put in. They're painted out, uh, and the drain lines coming out of the new green and then ultimately down to the lake. <clears throat> Another overhead view, once we've um, we've drained the green, we've got the uh, the greens mixed in here, and we've got the, the new sand. And then this, finally, this the, uh, the new... The new green and uh, and that back right pin position. Casey, these uh, bunkers did they uh, did you line them and did you uh, install drainage? We did. So we we we've got you know four inch drain pipe, perforated drain pipe underneath the uh, 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 in the cavity. We used a, a capillary concrete uh, bunker liner. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a if you think of Rice Krispie treats and um, the Rice Krispie being kind of large um, uh, pebbles 
and then the uh, the marshmallow part of it actually being kind of a, a concrete that kind of holds it together. So it's a very it's a very porous sur surface that you can just put water on it. Water goes right through it, but it it minimizes contamination coming up from the bunker edge, and it minimizes any washouts during a, a heavy rainstorm. Uh, the next hole is hole number five. Um, this is a long par four, uh, was a long par four, that played about 440 yards. Um, there's the back tee right here. Uh, there's no bunkers in the fairway and then the green complex here. Um, and we realized that we had an opportunity back on this peninsula to create uh, something special and, and look at a, a short, kind of a short reachable interesting par five. Here's a picture of the uh, of the green complex. You had bunker left, bunker right, and then this cart path here was really highly visible, and it was part of your second shot. A lot of balls hit it, kind of creamed toward the restroom, uh, and it was highly visual from the first landing area. Um, during the process, we 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 always knew that we were going to move the the tee back uh, all the way back to the edge, but we weren't sure if we were going to keep the cart path as as is and. This is kind of that iterative process where after we finished the first phase of construction, we went back and talked with the ownership and talked about relocating the cart path, adding adding more bunkers to uh, this golf course. And, and what, what was really nice is we had an ownership that was really focused on doing the right thing. And, and so often doing the right things means spending more money, but they really wanted to make sure that we, we did this project right. And I can't give enough credit to, um, to how they approach this. So again, here's the back tee. Um, previously, the uh, the back tee was used to be here. We had a lot of landscape vegetation that kind of screened this area, um, and then we did end up changing the car path. The previous car path kind of came out here, was a little bit more highly visible. We figured with a two-way car path and a turnaround, we could really kind of take that out of the view from golfers on the back tee. <clears throat> here's the first landing area, um, and previously there were no bunkers here. Uh, to begin with, and so uh, it's as as an architect and as a contractor and shaper, it's it's always challenging to kind of put a bunker where no bunker previously existed. Um, it's easier when you've got support mounting or a hill, but in this case, it was dead flat. So we had to bring in dirt, we had to bring in soil, and really try to um, to to create uh, uh, bunkers that fit in. Um, yardage wise, Robin, you might be able to help me out with this, and I might have shown it on the previous slide. Um, I think we were about 250 to reach the first bunker here, about 290, 95 to carry this bunker. And then this bunker is out here in about the 310 to 315 uh, range on the right hand side. That's correct. Okay. And then you can see a little bit, I'll, I'll jump to it, but you can see now we've got the green complex here. We've got a series of kind of short bunkers in the second landing area. We tightened up this, this throat. Um, this was another green extension that we did. And then you can see where the car path used to be and we, how we've moved it over to the side. <clears throat> the other thing that we did, and it wasn't visible in this first project, but uh, previously on, uh, on a bunker renovation that was done in the 90s, um, they had excess dirt. They created pretty significant mounting back here that was pretty steep and pretty quick. And we wanted to remove those steep, quick mounds out of the... Uh, out of the equation, so we, we we mellow those out. And then here's a shot again of the completed work. We we put new landscaping back here. We've got the car path, we've got the T. Um, and then what's nice is you can see here's hole number four, which is a par three um, that plays from this direction. You've got uh, hole number five, a par five right here. It really creates, in my mind, this this wonderful area of the golf course and i mentioned it 15 and 18 but it creates this intimate setting where if you're playing these tees you're you're either talking to you or heckling your friends who are playing three or four tee it really creates kind of this neat area of the golf course that's pretty special um here's the green complex i thought i had one i apologize i had these out of order but this is the this is kind of the view from the tees down the fairway you've got these uh, these two fairway bunkers on the left that are in the foreground. And then you, in this picture, you can't see the bunker on the right side of the uh, landing area, first landing area, but now you see the, the, the bunkers at the green. And then another shot of the green where we've, again, mellowed out the mounds and, and really 
tied the bunkers into into the new green complex. Uh, hole number nine was another one that we made some some pretty significant changes. Uh, it's a, about a 400 yard par four dogleg right. Um, previously, there were quite a bit of trees that that were in this area. A lot of them were failing. The turf grass wasn't wasn't doing well. And over the years, we had taken out a lot of these trees because they were dead and dying. But there was one significant tree right here um, that, um, again, wasn't in play for the better golfer. Most of the better golfers were able to kind of hit it up into the zone and uh, and play a fairly you know low iron shot into the green. But most of your higher handicap golfers were back here and then were completely stymied by that tree. Uh, here's another shot of uh, of the tree and the look toward the uh, the green complex. Um, through through this process, th this was not originally we originally had not planned on putting bunkers into the um, the landing area of number nine, and and we'd always wanted to do it. Uh, the ownership uh, was I think hesitant to this. Um, this was kind of the third phase of work that we were doing, and. Um, I'd like to think that they were more open to some of these changes as they saw the improvements that we had done on the first two first two parts of uh, of the course. And so we came back to them during construction, said, "Hey, we've got an idea that I think can work. Let's let's look at taking out this this tree. Um, and you know how members love trees, but let's add a series of bunkers in here and really create kind of an interesting risk reward um, cape hole for." For golfers of all abilities, and so we located a series of three bunkers on um, on the right side, and then one long bunker on the left. Where was um, the Where was the tree near the? It, first it was right bunkers? here. It was right here. So right in this location, right here. Um, and most of your most of your higher handicap golfers were were hitting it back here. Um, what's hard to tell in this picture is is are these trees are kind of at a diagonal from the direction of the tee shot that's coming in. So. Really, you know, we felt that if you're, you know, um, uh, uh, an average golfer, you know, a 12 handicap golfer that can carry the ball 230, that this is a bunker here that you might be able to carry and have a shorter shot in the green. If you can carry the ball 260 to 270, this is a bunker that you might be able to carry. And then this one being probably about 290 to 300, if you can carry this bunker, um, you know, depending on the line that you want to take. So as much as you wanted to bite off, you could, you could, potentially have a shorter shot into uh, into the green. And then we we added a bunker on the left-hand side just for, you know, you've got some people who are hit 320 that um, we just wanted to add a little bit more to this and a bunker that's only in play for the longest of long hitters, um, but not really in play for, for anybody else. And this is a, a shot from the T-Complex uh, by a professional photographer. I'm pretty sure the the sky's been photoshopped <laughs> um, and we haven't really been able to cut the fairway in here, but you kind of see how these, how these bunkers are stair stepped in here and the opportunities for hitting different lake shots to get a short shot into the green complex. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to show you a, 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 a few final shots. Uh, these aren't before and afters, but just final shots. This is hole number one. Some of the bunkering that we did uh, on that, on that hole, uh, back to three green, the, the bunker we, we did around that green. Uh, this is hole number 11, uh, a short par four. Previously, there was a bunker here that we rebuilt, but the there was another bunker that was directly across. Both bunkers were probably in that 230 range. We took the, the bunker that was here and shoved it further down the fairway. Um, and what's interesting strategically about that is it really does open up this right side for the higher handicap golfer. But the way that green slopes, this green slopes pretty significantly from right to left. And so uh, really the best angle or the best approach into this green is from the left side of the fairway. Uh, this is a shot of hole number 12. Uh, again, we had... Uh, there used to be a bunker here on the right. There was there was one large tree that really created a double jeopardy situation where that you were in the bunker and you were also behind the tree. Um, we were able to remove that tree really more for safety purposes. It was failing um, and create a more open golf hole. <clears throat> Uh, another shot of Casey, 12. When you say for, Casey, when you say for safety purposes, what safety purposes was the tree removed for? 
Well, there was there was portions of the tree that would shear off or fall. It, it was a eucalyptus tree, and and in, in 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 any wind, it seemed that there was another part of that tree that was falling, and a portion of that tree had already fallen, and they had taken off that, and so I think that it wasn't balanced, and so it just made sense to have it removed. And then this is a thirteenth bean, and and I, I apologize. I wish I had a, a before and after shot of the green. Uh, this is a green that we completely rebuilt. We had actually slid the green over probably about 25 feet from where it used to be. It used to be located more in this location. Uh, this was another uh, Ted Robinson green that had kind of a, a, a tiered green, a small pot bunker on the left, and we, we built more of a straightaway par three. We actually added a little bit of yardage to the back tee and, and pushed it back. You built, you built that uh, collection area behind the green as well? Oh, I, I thank you for bringing that up. So that is a little bit of a collection area. And then we decided that we'd add just kind of a fun tee for hole number 14, 14 plays down this way. Um, it's just a small flat area. Um, 14 is already a long par four. Um, I think it, I think from the, uh, the current tees or the original tees that played 430, Robin, does that sound right? Uh, from the original tee, it was 400, 404, and then from the new tee, it's 473. 473, okay. So we add, it's 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 more of a fun tee. I don't know, fun's maybe not the word, but me, it's not an everyday tee, but kind of a, a, an interesting tee to but play. But there's no, there's no monument for that back tee location? I think there is. Robin? Uh, yeah, there is. So our, our back tees... Uh, so we call them our black tees. Our back tees are now 6820. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, a combo tee. So which would be, uh, what do you want to call it? the difference between black and blues? So we try to encourage our members to play the blue tees at 404 or the combo tee, which has it at 404. That back tee at 6,800 yards total and 473. And this which plays into the wind is really for, hey, our really, really good players. I mean, it's... Uh, you got to golf your ball and be ready to play. It's a it's a challenging hole at 470 in the wind on Kikuya grass. But there's tees there's tees back there every day, or most every day. Most every day, yes. Now is that is that a situation where you need to take your driver with you up to that par three green if you're playing that back tee because it doesn't look like there's any access to it. Uh, there is a car path is is just about the left here. You know, we tried to you know eliminate car paths from view and close to areas. So, hey, you don't have to bring it, but, you know, we'll play a little quicker if you do bring a, a club with you. Kind of similar on, at Riviera from number six to six green to seven tee, where it's just sure. all a surround cut from the green up to the tee box on seven. Yeah, it's pretty similar. <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh, no, no problem. And, uh, and so now we get into lessons learned. Robin, if you don't want mine staying on because i think you're part a lot of these and i can i can chime in as well but if you want to go through these robin that would be great yeah i think the quick bullet points are is hey the behind the scenes tours um, so one of the things that we did is as we were doing construction before construction uh, myself and our golf pros always kind of gave quote behind the scenes tour so we took carts took them in the dirt took them under construction showed the greens uh being built um, walked in the dirt where you see in, in all the, the photos, the construction zones. Uh, and that really helped give a lot of um, just excitement because, you know, I think everybody wants to be a golf course architect and members as well. So it gave them a chance to kind of see and, and ask some questions and they felt a part of the process. Uh, the second thing on there was, was don't close the golf course, which sounds something that, hey, most people wouldn't want to do. Um, but our owners say, hey, we're, we're keeping the golf course open. And we didn't anticipate that being a big deal, but it turned out to be a huge deal of goodwill. Uh, so two big reasons the goodwill came in was one, members said, hey, at least you're trying. Uh, you're trying to keep the golf course open, uh, which are still able to play. So we appreciate that. And number two, every time a member was on that golf course, they were looking over the whole one hole over or two holes over and being like, Hey, something's going on. So they got to see the improvements uh, and get excited about it. Now the next lesson learned on there is short videos. Um, we've got a woman who works with us. Her name is Catherine. And that was kind of her, her job during this project was just to make videos. So we sent out uh, videos every week. 
of what was going on on the golf course, what was going on on the hole, how it was going to play different. Uh, we kind of found that the sweet spot in those videos was, you know, uh, 60 to 90 seconds to make them, them quick and for people to watch them. And people who either weren't at the golf course or didn't, you know, wanted to look a whole over what was going on, they kind of got to see really close uh, from the video what was happening. I think I saw, I think I saw a couple of those that you had posted on LinkedIn where it was almost like a uh, 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 live from the masters kind of thing with you and Casey sitting opposite each other in almost <laughs> like a talk show newsroom kind of setting. I'm sure the members enjoyed that. Yeah, I probably spend more time on LinkedIn than anybody should. Uh, but yeah, we did videos of interviews. We did videos of the golf course with the construction crew, before and afters, educating as well. So they took on all different uh, themes and it seemed to go really, really good for us. Um, the next thing on there is just to say, create a one-page summary sheet. Casey did an incredible job putting together a bid document or a bid package. Uh, and I think one thing that would have been helpful for us was to have a one-page summary of the main highlights. So everybody was 100% on the same page. I think the bid document and the scope of work might have been 30 pages long. Uh, and things get lost in there. And that was, I think, one of the challenges with our uh, contractor, subcontractor, and bunker shaper was to say, hey, here's very clearly what we're looking for. And here's very clearly, um, you know, what the guidelines are on the really, really big stuff. Uh, the next thing on this is open holes over time. I think a lot of people do a open everything at once and do an opening party. Uh, everybody that we talked to that did an opening party and opened everything at once said it was kind of a bust. Because um, if you do a shotgun, not everybody can play in it. If you do tea times, only a few people are going to watch everybody tee off. Uh, so we just said, hey, once it's ready to play, let's open it. And I think that got a lot of goodwill as well. It just members said, hey, you're, you're trying. You're trying to get us on the golf course. Um, and doing the right thing by the golf course, but not making it more challenging or inconvenient for us. Uh, this, la this change orders, it seems pretty obvious, um, but one of the things that we could have done a better job of, specifically me, was to do a better, um, a better process on managing our change orders. So we did, you know, when you're doing a project of this size and, you know, we did our project in three months where most people said it would have taken six months, uh, we had a hundred different workers at, at maximum on the day. And when you're trying to get things done fast, all of a sudden you're like, Hey, we're going to make the bunker bigger. We're going to add a bunker. We're going to subtract a bunker. We're going to change the cart path, add cart path that, um, you know, those change orders add up. And next thing you know, Hey, if your contractor doesn't give you a price quickly, um, and he's like, Hey, I'm busy. We're moving on to the next thing. You kind of lose track of all of those. So that happened to us where we made some changes. Uh, we said, hey, we're going to do this. Um, hey, give us a price. And we weren't, I was not uh, quick enough or didn't uh, um, press enough to get those, those prices in as, as we went. Um, and, and then last, and go, go ahead, John. Well, yeah, it was me. I was going to say, um, the last one I added to the list that you gave us, Robin, uh, is document quantities and planning. And that ties in a little bit with change orders. But knowing what our quantities were when we went in, um, we end up GPSing or surveying all the improvements at the end. And, and really, you know, that, that saved us quite a bit of money because we realized that our quantities were more in line with what we were planning as opposed to um, what was potentially going to be, a fair, what, what we thought might be a significant overage in, in cost uh, ended up being quite a, quite a significant savings. Yeah, our, uh, one of the things that we had gotten from our contractor was, hey, you're projected to be um, two hundred thousand dollars over what we what kind of was our, you know, month ahead, uh, you know, say thirty days to completion of project. He's like, hey, you're going to be two hundred grand over, and you know that put us on a little bit of panic. And thankfully, we had good good backup information um, when Casey did the planning documents. So we could go back and say, hey, uh, we actually show us being two hundred grand under. So that was uh, important to have those, those good documents or those good planning uh, documents to go back to to say, hey, something doesn't, doesn't seem right. So that was, that's a big deal as well. And I think that's something that Casey does really, really well. And if you talk to any, anybody who's worked with to say Casey's plans 
um, are done really, really well. They're really accurate for the scope of work and what's going to be needed. So I think that's something that Casey does really, really well. And it uh, swung us $400,000 uh, at the very end. Now, guys, how much, I know the two of you have worked together at Mountain Meadows in the uh, bunker renovation there uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, actually, longer than that. Jeez, time's marching on. Uh, I know that there was obviously a tighter budget there, a much smaller scale uh, of activity. If you don't mind talking about it, how much was the all told uh, renovation ballpark? Uh, uh, six million. And <laughs> we were we were very fortunate because when we went to bid on this, we went to bid on this in the summer of 2021. Um, and that was kind of before the inflation spike. So uh, had we done it, um, you know, we had we gone to bid or use 2022 summer pricing, we would have been at the $7 million mark. That's a yeah. little higher than the uh, $700,000 uh, bunker reno at Mountain Meadows. <laughs> 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 so uh, actually, just to back up, to talk a little bit about Mountain Meadows, when you did the bunkering there, did you line those and put drainage in those as well? We we, we put drainage in there, but we did not put liners in those bunkers. Because I know Casey, I think when I was in the desert, we had talked about uh, the bunker renovation at Monterey. And with the sand cap that's out there, you know, you don't need uh, liners so much and you don't need drainage because of the, the sand base. Obviously, that makes a big difference when it comes to pricing. Sure. Who was the contractor that, uh, that did Newport Beach? Uh, it was Integrity Golf Construction. And had you worked with them before? I had. I, I, I've done, uh, they, they've done quite a bit of work for us. So, um, you know, they, uh, there were some challenging parts to our relationship with them. Um, and I think, Robin, if we kind of said if we had to do it again, we would, we, I think we would work with them again. Yeah, I think I mean, uh, no, no, nothing goes perfect, right? I mean, you figure out your team at your club or anybody, you know, even family, right? You don't agree on everything and you have discussions and, some things go as planned and some things don't go as planned. Um, but hey, all in, they did a good job. They did good work. Um, we were on time and, you know, uh, had a good communication. There were some challenges, but that would be everything. Um, I don't think there's anything that, I don't think anybody's ever been on a project and it was like, man, all of these contractors got along perfectly. <laughs> and all of these subcontractors were so nice to work with and they agreed on everything. Um, and so we had a little speed bump, but we got through it and, and, and we navigated it. And, uh, but yeah, I think they, they did good work and we would use them again. Yeah. And, you know, they, two things, they had a, a really good on-site superintendent that was uh, dedicated and wanted to do the right thing and really kind of was the glue on holding a lot of the different kind of entities together. Uh, and then also I, I, you know, with at the end, when we came down to the $400,000 swing, um, they, they, they owned it, you know, it wasn't like we had to battle them and try to convince them. We presented them with the information and they were, they were, they were very good about it. So hats off to them. And the, the turf that was used for the, the greens. We reused, we actually created two things. One is we saved the, the, the greens when, when we demolished uh, the greens at 13, 15 and 17, we took that side and we put it off to the side um, and and kept it in the shade and babied it while the green was under construction. Um, and then we needed a little bit of extra sod for those greens as well as the green extensions. And previously Scott Dye had created a turf nursery the year before and used aeration plugs from, um, uh, from aeration to establish that green. So we really wanted to make sure that we got a, a similar green or turf type that we had on, on the other golf, uh, on the other, other golf greens. So you recycled and salvaged the in-house poana. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then what about the uh, the sod that you used in the fairways where needed? We 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 purchased, I think, almost all of it from West Coast. Um, and and it, well, Kukuya. Yeah. Kuk, sorry, it's Kukuya. And and then we ended up uh, we ended up making the decision. I think I had mentioned that we were going to try out different T types or uh, Bermuda types for the the tees. Um, once we saw how well the driver range tee did, we decided that we wanted to sod all the tees uh, throughout the golf course in Kukuya. So we, we purchased that sod from West Coast. Um, it's interesting. I know that I've done this. This is a little. This is a much larger project. 
Um, often, if you can harvest sod from on site uh, and, and reuse it, um, even though they're both Kakuya, the, the sod that you're getting from on site is, is really acclimated to that soil and that temperature. Whereas if you're bringing it in from the desert, you, 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 there's a, a little bit of a learning curve for the Kakuya to kind of get acclimated. So, um, but yeah, we purchased all the Kakuya from West Coast. Now, Robin had mentioned, uh, I saw Robin earlier in the week, uh, and we had talked about the uh, decision to, to go with the Kakuya tea. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and what uh, the motivation was for that and the challenges uh, with using a Kukuya tea versus a Bermuda? Robin, you want to take that one? I'll chime in. <laughs> sure, I'll, 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 I'll start. Um, so we have, uh, we had before our tea boxes were very small. They were rounded, um, not as a knock. They were just that very traditional Ted Robinson kind of elevated tea, small tea, very round. Um, and they had gotten crowned. Uh, so that was a big reason for the need for the project. And then as we were doing this, and our teas were kind of a, a Bermuda that was overseeded with rye, and they were probably 50% rye year round. Like they never got there. Uh, second piece of it, we also do the Hogue Classic. Um, so we got to make sure the teas look good on TV and in March. So we throw extra rye seed down um, kind of before the tournament. So it was, they, they never really transitioned out. So as we started, we were like, hey, what are we going to do? Um, and we were originally planning about Bermuda teas was our original discussion. And then it led to, hey, are we doing round shaped teas, circular teas? Or are we doing square teas with borders? Because so that way the Kikuya wouldn't grow into it. And we went round and round and round, talked to other courses, talked to other superintendents. And then somebody once said, why would you plant Bermuda grass on a Kikuya farm? It's like everything is Kikuya. Why would you do that? Uh, and it really got us thinking. And then we called around to a bunch of other courses that had Kikuya and Bermuda tees or were a Kikuya golf course that went to Bermuda tees. And I was like, hey, what would you do if you had it to do all over again? And six out of seven golf courses that we reached out to that had Kikuya and Bermuda said, hey, I would do a Kikuya range tee and I would do Kikuya tees. So uh, we went with a Kikuya tee on the driver range to kind of test it out and it worked well. And then we kept going on with uh, with the tees and did those as Kikuya and it's been uh, it's been well received. Yeah, that's amazing because I mean if you could in I, I in my club here at, at South Hills it's the same thing. If you could keep one uh, year round and just go with it, it, it when it, in terms of the tee boxes it's it's so much better. So we stopped overseeding the the tee boxes with rye and just let them go Bermuda and you got two bad months you know based on where we are in the San Gabriel Valley um, but that's uh, that's fantastic because it's really great that the you've got the driving range and the tee boxes the same turf and the same height of turf that you have in the fairways so it's it's it, the consistency um, I, I commend you on, on doing that um, and Robin forgive me for asking you this question four or five times over the last week I just couldn't get my head around uh, uh, a Kikuya tea, but it makes sense. Oh. Yeah, no, it's one of those things that I think we were, I mean, we luckily we had a long time to think about it and prepare for it. That is, we all originally were like, what? Um, we told our owners, they were like, what? Why would you do that? And then as you just, just because nobody's done it doesn't mean it's the, the wrong reason. But we had gotten, um, like I say, the more we just thought about it, we're like, hey, logically, you know, everything on our golf course is Kikuya. Our members love our Kikuya fairways. And we don't have to overseed. Um, and the thing that kept playing in the back of at least my mind was, why would you plant Bermuda on a Kikuya farm? And everywhere you looked on our old tees, Kikuya just kept coming in. And every superintendent was like, hey, you can't win. Um, so I guess we, we've, been, we've been happy with it. It's more of a maintenance question, but I guess the challenge down the road will be to keep it uh thin enough and to keep it from getting spongy and and too bushy uh i guess that's more of a a, a maintenance practice but uh those are all the questions uh that i have um a couple comments that have come in from the uh, the audience jerry sweet willis was down there at newport beach last week he said and uh just really commends you guys on on a, on a beautiful job well done said in particular the 17th hole uh, is amazing. It's night and day, and just uh, wanted to uh, extend a kudos and a congratulations to you both. Thank you. 
All right, gentlemen, that's all the time we have this morning. We're actually over a little bit. Uh, on behalf of the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA, we'd like to extend our, extend our gratitude to Casey O'Callaghan for, for putting together this presentation and sharing his expertise with the, with the SCPGA membership. Robin, thank you for joining us as well this morning and allowing us to, to, to uh, come to your club this morning and, and see all the, all the great stuff that's happened. I would imagine that you're going to get a bunch of emails and phone calls over the next month or so of PGA members that are going to be looking to come out and play. Uh, well, hey, we do have, we, guys. we are, we are hosting the annual meeting on December uh, 12th. So that would be the chance uh, December 12th, of the annual meeting we are hosting right. the mixed team tournament in February, which I think is February 12th out of the uh, member female team piece tournament. Awesome. That's awesome. All right, guys, take care. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for supporting the catalyst webinar series and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks John. Robin. Thanks.